fish god, god of big fishes and little fishes, save us.
Good morning, everybody. I'm Billy Hester and welcome to Asbury Memorial's online service for Sunday, January 24th. We're really glad you're here to worship with us today. And I'm very glad to be back with you. I've had a two week break from our services and I wanna thank those who helped lead the services, Reverend Claire Merritt, Reverend Richard Allen, Reverend Bob Shabatal, Ray Ellis and Greg Martin for leading those hymns. Thank you all for helping us during these last two Sundays. The beautiful flowers here for us today are given in honor of Reverend Claire Merritt's birthday whose birthday is today. Happy birthday, Claire. And there are other Asburyans, a lot of Asburyans having a birthday today. Tom Davis, Fitz Kincaid, Colin Knox, Jennifer Knox, Kevin Strong, and Ann Allen Westbrook. Tomorrow on the 25th is George Lindsay's birthday and Dylan Richards. On the 26th, Harry Herschel will be celebrating his 88th birthday. Happy birthday, Harry. On the 27th is Catherine Murph's birthday and Benjamin Murphy's birthday. He's, Benjamin will be turning 12. That's funny. It's Catherine Murph's, M-U-R-P-H, and Benjamin Murphy, M-U-R-P-H-R-E-E. They're having their birthday on the same day on the 27th. On the 29th is Donna Danley's birthday and Cole Strong's. Happy birthday, everybody. We have a couple of great anniversaries to celebrate. Tomorrow, um, no, on the 26th is George and Laura Lindsay's anniversary. And on the 28th is Joe Drake and Sherry Sheridan's anniversary. Happy anniversary, couples. Hey, I want to remind you that we are back having our 10 o'clock hour on Sunday mornings. Everybody is invited to that. And it's a great program on the Ten Commandments by Sister Joan Chittister. If you're not familiar with Joan Chittister, Chittister you've got to be part of this. She's just fabulous. So um, you can find out about um, participating in that through our um, newsletter, which is on our website. You know, I want to take a moment to thank all of you for your faithful giving during this past year, during 2020, a very challenging year for all of us. You know, the church budget last year was $719,000. The offering received totaled $680,000. Now, I realize that's $39,000 short of the goal, but for a year during a pandemic, and a year of not having in-person services where we would have more funds given by visitors and people who, are not, who have not pledged to the church. It is really remarkable. So thank you for your giving, for your faithfulness, for your support. The other good news is that since we have not been able to meet, we did not spend as much money. For instance, we didn't have Wednesday night suppers. So even though we didn't make the $719,000 goal, we didn't spend that mu as much. And so we still ended up being in the black just by a little bit, but we are in the black this year. So for this, we're very thankful. Helen Downing and the stewardship team and Cynthia Harold and her finance committee, they really wanna thank you uh, for your support and giving. And they also want me to ask you to keep making the church a priority in your life in 2021. As our lay leader Preston Hodges often says, no margin, no mission. And that is in order to keep the lights on, to keep bringing these wonderful services to you, to have music for our choir, to pay for salaries. We need funds to keep developing this ministry. And by the way, one of our goals this year is to be able to offer live stream worship services when we start back with our in-person services. We want to stay connected to all of the people who have become a, a part of our church during the pandemic, but who live far away. And we want to stay connected with our homebound members. We want them to be able to participate in our worship services. So this is an important ministry that we will have as a goal this year, but we need equipment that we don't have, and we may even need a staff person for this role to help us in this ministry. So that's going to be an important expense for us this year. So keep this in mind as we continue to develop 
our ministry here at Asbury Memorial. Speaking of technology, I hope you will join us for our Zoom coffee hour after today's worship service. The ID number is the church's phone number, 912-233-4351. And the password is Asbury, Asbury with a capital A. Now will you join me in the responsive call to worship, which is found in your bulletin. If you're not on our email list to receive a bulletin, just email us and say, please put me on your email list so I can get a Sunday bulletin each week. God bless you as we worship God. God of peace, we confess that we are not at peace with others or with ourselves. We bring to you all that tears us apart, discord in our families, violence in our world, our own conflicted hearts. In your mercy, mend us. Reconnect us to one another and to you. Let peace reign over all the earth. In the word who has come to dwell with us, God has given us grace upon grace, forgiveness that is stronger than our sins, love that can heal every broken heart. Christ is here. Love is here. Rise, shine, for your light has come. Good morning. Our Taze hymn this morning is Come, O Redeemer, Come. It's one of our favorites here at Asbury. The words are printed in your bulletin so you can join me on the refrain, but if you don't have your bulletin, the words are very simple. They are Come, O Redeemer, Come, Grant Us Mercy. Come, O Redeemer, Come, Grant Us Peace. Please join me. <clears throat>
The scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. For the word of God in scripture and story, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. Good morning. Let us center our hearts and our minds for prayer with a few moments of blessed silence. Savior Christ, we confess that though we have heard you call our name, we have been reluctant to follow you. We are stubborn to live into your ways of justice that call us to dismantle structures that empower us over others. We hesitate to turn away from systems that benefit us. We squirm when called to repentance, unwilling to abandon the worldly systemic sin that creates wealth and power for some and requires others to go without. Forgive us, call us into repentance and call us by name so we may turn our hearts to you. Savior Christ, help us to live into your way, your truth and your life as we pray for the world today. For the people of this congregation, for those who are sick, facing health crises, experiencing relationship difficulties, and financial crises. For Betty, Renee, Helen, Claire, Jimmy, Grover, John, Roy, Bob, Sean, Jeff, and Becky. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who suffer and those in trouble, for inmates and those who are seeking jobs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the concerns of this local community, for health care workers, for funeral workers, for our city and county employees. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in military service, for healing, for understanding and love of neighbor, and blessing upon our new president and vice president. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For nations, their people and their leaders for restoration of the world in the face of such deep losses from COVID-19. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the Church Universal, its members and its mission, make us a beacon of hope and peace. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. In communion with the saints who go before us in glory and for all who mourn their loss. For Karen Locke, Ken Cranick, Bruce Ackerman, Judy Francis Varnado, Leon Walker, Rayburn Jeffers, 
Gary Swindell Sr. Ernest Zittrauer. Charles Chick Messenger. Theron Howard Smith Sr. Chuck Saltzman. Winifred Alley. Carolyn Godley Gettleman. Jeannie McGowan. Mabel Wensley Jorgensen. Charles Bonner C.B. Etheridge. Annette Herndon Jenkins. Mary Lou and John Russell. And for Margaret Thomas. As Jesus defeated death, he also showed us how to live, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the story of Jonah and the great big fish. Well, it, and it's kind of the story that needs some audience participation. Okay? So, as you know, of course, the main character is Jonah. And as you also probably know, Jonah had a really bad attitude problem. So, in this story, whenever I say the name Jonah, I want you guys to go, nah. All right, so let's try it. Jonah. Nah. Good, I think some of you have done that before. <laughs> okay, now, whenever I say the name of the city, Nineveh, I want you to go like this. Huh? Okay. Nineveh. Huh? Jonah. Yeah. Good. You guys are great. Okay. Now, when I say the words great big fish, I want you to go wow, wow. <laughs> great big fish. Wow, wow. Nineveh. Huh? Jonah. All right, and now when I say the Lord, the God of heaven, and I have to say all of those words, I want you to go, Ooh. <laughs> the Lord, the God of heaven. Ooh. Good. Nineveh. Yeah. Great. Okay, now last of all, um, we have to make a storm. So this is going to be a little more complicated. It's choreographed. So we're going to have three different parts. All right? Um, when I say storm, the first part of the storm is going to be the wind. So you guys are going to go whoosh, this side. Whoosh, whoosh. Good, good. All right. And then after you hear whoosh, you guys are going to be the lightning. So you're going to go flash, flash. <laughs> flash, flash. Okay. Let's just try storm. Whoosh, flash, flash. Good. And then our choir over here is going to be the thunder. And they're going to go boom. Right, you can say boom boom too if you want. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now let's try it all together. Ready? Storm. Oh, I'm sorry, the balcony, I, I divided the entire sanctuary into two. I'm sorry. So the balcony will go, this side will go with this, and do your shh, and this side will go over here with the splash splash. Okay? All right, great. All right, um, I think. I think we're about ready. To, I think we're ready to tell the story. Okay, you ready? Okay. A long time ago, there was a man by the name of Jonah. Yeah. No, really, there was. Yeah. And, and this Jonah yeah. was a prophet. That's somebody who listens to God and then tells other people what he or she hears. Well, one day, God spoke to our prophet friend and told him to get up and go to the city of Nineveh. And say to them, I, I said, get up and go to the city of Nineveh. 
and say, I said, get up and go to the city, uh, to the city. <clears throat> okay, and say to the people in that city, you people are really messing up. You're doing all kinds of things that you shouldn't be doing. And you're not doing what you ought to be doing. If you people don't clean up your act, you're going to have to answer to the Lord, the God of heaven. Well, maybe you can guess what God, what answer God heard from our friend Jonah. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what he heard. Our friend the prophet said, no way. I'm not preaching to those jerks in Nineveh. I said, I'm not preaching to them. Uh, they're not my kind of people. And with that, he went down to the sea, he got on board a ship, and he sailed in the exact opposite direction from where he was supposed to go. Well, I want you to think for a minute about the Lord, the God of heaven. Ooh. Yeah. God is pretty big, all right. In fact, God is everywhere. So it was really silly to try to run away. And as soon as the boat got out to sea, God threw right at it a great big storm. Yeah, yes, it stormed. And it stormed. And just when you thought it would stop, it stormed. Some more. Good. So finally, the sailors on board said, well, maybe there's somebody on this boat that's, that's done something wrong. And that's what's causing this terrible weather. <laughs> well, it didn't take them long to figure out who it was. It was Jonah. Yeah. Oh, yes, it was. And the sailors asked him, can you tell us why this is happening to us? Where do you come from and what do you do? The prophet said to them, I'm a Hebrew. And I worship the one who created both the sea and the dry land, for I worship the Lord, the God of heaven. Ooh. Yeah, when the sailors heard that, they were pretty scared. They said, what do we got to do to make the ocean calm down? And our prophet friend said, you must throw me overboard. Well, the sailors didn't want to do that. So instead, they tried to row the boat backward to the land, but the sea grew rougher and rougher, and the wind blew harder and harder, and the waves got bigger and bigger, until finally they had to pick up the prophet and throw him overboard. And as soon as they did, the storm <laughs> stopped. Do you think that that was the end of Jonah? Yeah. Yeah, you're right again. <laughs> Even though our friend was out on the ocean, God gave an order, and the prophet was swallowed up by a great, big fish. For three days and three nights, he was inside the belly of that beast, until at last, in his great affliction, his spirit cried out within him, and he spoke to the Lord, saying unto him, Please get me out of this great, big fish! So the Lord spoke again, and the mouth on that great, big fish... And the prophet popped out into, onto the shore. Well, our friend knew what he had to do. He went straight to the city of Nineveh. Yes, he did. And he said to them, you people have 40 days to shape up, or the city will be destroyed. And do you know what happened to them? When the people in the city heard what the prophet said, they believed him. And they stopped doing bad things. And they asked God for forgiveness. And as soon as they did that, God forgave them. And do you know what our friend the prophet said when he saw that? He said, oh God, why did you have to go and do that? That's just like you, you're always forgiving people. I was kind of hoping I'd get to see you trash this whole place. <laughs> and God said, my friend, I know the city is filled with people who don't know their right hands from their left, but they're still my children, just as you are. And they will always belong to me, the Lord, the God of heaven. And that is the story of how Nineveh was saved by Jonah because the Lord, the God of heaven, sent Jonah to Nineveh even though the Lord, the God of heaven, had to convince Jonah with a great big fish and a storm, a really big
big storm. A really, really big storm. And that is the end of the story. <laughs> Oh, Jonah, he lived in a whale. Oh, Jonah, he lived in a whale. For he made his home in that fish's abdomen. Oh, Jonah, he lived in a whale. That's from the musical Porgy and Bess, written by brothers Ira and George Gershwin. You know, Janet Wagner read our scripture passage for us today from the book of Jonah about the story of Jonah, but it was just part of the story where Jonah goes to Nineveh to bring the word of the Lord to the Ninevites who repent. But Sherry led the congregation in the telling of the entire story, and so now we know that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh with the word of the Lord. And that's when all of this other stuff happened to him, like being thrown overboard and being swallowed by a whale. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. It ain't necessarily so. It ain't necessarily so. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. Well, it's pretty obvious that the writer of the story of Jonah did not mean for us to take it literally. I mean, there are so many exaggerations, so many things that are over the top. A man in a belly of a fish for three days and then burped out. <laughs> the cows in Nineveh repenting and putting on sackcloths. You know, the late great theologian Marcus Borg used to say, I don't take the Bible literally. I take it seriously. And then when Marcus was feeling a little frisky, he'd add, and if you take it literally, then you don't take it seriously. What Borg meant was that we diminish the Bible when we only read it literally because there is so much more power and genius and timelessness in metaphor. You know, my grandparents lived on the May River in Bluffton, South Carolina. And my sister and my cousins and I would often spend our summers over there with them. Now, back in the 1960s, Bluffton was wonderfully primitive and rustic. I recently heard an advertisement for a store that said it was in downtown Bluffton. And I had to laugh because the Bluffton I knew didn't have a downtown. It only had one tiny little building that was a post office, had a school, and one little grocery store. That was it. Well, my grandparents next door neighbor was a man named Chess Hale. Mr. Hale was the darkest white man I've ever seen because all he wore 24 hours a day were Bermuda shorts. His skin was baked by the sun and he had a great big barrel hairy chest uh, striking white hair that contrasted with his dark skin, and he had a big, deep barrel of a voice. He was a larger-than-life character, this man who lived on the water. Well, when I was a very young child, I was told that Mr. Hale taught Tarzan how to swim. That's right. Back in those days, Tarzan was a man named Johnny Weismuller, the world's fastest swimmer, the first person to swim 100 meters under a minute, and the first to swim the 440 freestyle under five. He won five gold medals in the Olympics. Chess Hale taught him how to swim. <laughs> and that's what I told all of my friends. 
I know the man who taught Tarzan how to swim. And then I would sing to them, Oh, Tarzan was taught by Chess Hale. Oh, Tarzan was taught by Chess Hale. Oh, no one was faster. He learned from the master. Oh, Tarzan was taught by Chess Hale. Well, when I got a little older, I unfortunately came to realize that Mr. Hale probably didn't really teach Johnny Weismuller how to swim. <laughs> well, why in the world did people say that? They said it because it was true in a sense. You see, they said it because no one knew more about the water than Chess Hale. They said it because if you want to learn something about rivers and oceans and nature, then you better keep your eyes and ears open when you're around, Mr. Hale. They said it because the man who walked around shirtless every day, he was the real Tarzan. <laughs> he wasn't play acting. He was the real deal. That's why they say, said it. And so you see, we gain so much more from metaphor. And so it's important not to get hung up on whether a biblical story actually happened. What we need to be asking is, what is God trying to say to me and to you through this story? What is the timeless truth it is trying to convey to us. God wants Jonah to go to Nineveh to encourage the people there to repent. But that's the last thing Jonah wants to do. He doesn't want to go to Nineveh because he doesn't want the people there to repent. He wants the Ninevites to suffer to get what they have coming to them. After all, they were the enemies of the Israelites. They had done bad, evil things to them. They didn't deserve mercy. You know, I confess that I am drawn to movies with the lead actors of Clint Eastwood or Liam Neeson or Denzel Washington. The plots of their movies are usually the same plot. Some people do some very horrible, violent, evil things to good, innocent people. And the rest of the movie is about Clint, Liam, and Denzel getting even, taking revenge. And when they take revenge, I mean they really take revenge. Payback, after all, feels good. Make my day. These are what we could call Jonah movies. Writer Anne Lamott said she was stunned one Sunday when she heard her pastor say from the pulpit, when someone is acting but ugly... God loves them just the same as God loves the innocent. They are still just as loved by God. And Anne says, this is what drives me crazy, that God seems to have no taste and no standards. And yet, she writes, on most days, this is what gives some of us hope. Hundreds of years after the story of Jonah, Jesus taught its message again. He said, you have been told to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you to love your enemy and to pray for those who persecute you. But of course, that's not what Jonah wanted to do. Barbara Brown Taylor says, Jonah might have said okay if God had sent him someplace nearby like Jericho. But Nineveh was out of the question. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, now known as Iraq. 
which was as hostile to Israel then as it is now. And sending Jonah there was like sending a nobody from Tel Aviv to tell Saddam Hussein he was going to hell if he didn't change. Jonah didn't want any part of it. For one, <laughs> he knew what usually happens to God's messengers who bring tough news. And secondly, he had no desire to participate in Nineveh's salvation. He hated these brutal people and wanted God to destroy them. He wants revenge. They deserve it. And so immediately Jonah goes down to the port of Joppa so he can sail off far away to Timbuktu, thinking God won't bother him there. But as you know, there's the storm that's passing over and the sailors draw straws. Jonah loses, is thrown overboard, enter free willy. Realizing that God won't leave him alone until he goes to Nineveh, Jonah finally agrees to do what God had asked him to do. He'll do no more, no less. And he does. He brings them the word of the Lord, and lo and behold, all of the people, even their animals, repent, and God forgives them and spares them. Needless to say, everyone is happy except Jonah. He yells at God, didn't I tell you from the start? I knew this was going to happen. That's why I tried to get away. I knew you would never go through with it. I knew you would change your mind. You don't get angry easily and you are full of love, ready as the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. Well, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. God asked Jonah why he's so mad. But rather than take the opportunity to deal with his anger, Jonah stomps out of the city and sits down in the hot sun to have a good sulk. His whole personal sense of justice has been violated. Well, the text says, that God causes a broadleaf tree to spring up so that it offers Jonah shade. The branches and leaves grow over Jonah and cool him off. And Jonah is enjoying the shade when a worm comes and starts eating away at the tree and kills it and Jonah gets angry again. And then God says to him, what right have you to get angry over this shade tree? Jonah says, plenty of right, plenty of right. And God says, well, you love a plant. You love a plant which you did nothing to help it grow and nothing but watch it die. Shouldn't I love and pity Nineveh? The vast city filled with 120,000 people who hardly know right from wrong. Not to mention all those cows. <laughs> and the answer is, of course, yes, God should and will love Nineveh. And so should Jonah. And so should you and me. After all, as Reverend Claire Merritt said recently in one of her prayers, we are all in this together. We are all in this together as a family, as a church, as a city, as a country, and as visitors in this world. And after all, we are all siblings. All of us 
are children of God. And I believe that when each of us concludes our time on this planet and we become our true selves, our spiritual selves, I believe we will realize just how connected all of us truly are. And so if you ever feel vengeful, if you ever want revenge, remember that our God says that what's most important in life is not revenge, it's not even justice, it's mercy. Mercy. And that means that maybe, maybe the next time you and I screw up, the next time we're the ones who are stubborn, are unfaithful, are impatient, are irresponsible, are late, are sick, are tired, or just plain wrong, we can be thankful that we are loved and worth being loved anyway. Knowing this, knowing this, maybe we can respond less like Jonah and more like Jonah's God. More graceful, more forgiving, more surprisingly unjust in our mercy. Maybe we can be more like Jesus Christ. So share God's love with all. So share God's love with all. Go be like Jesus. It really will free us. So share God's love with all. Amen and amen. And now will you turn in your bulletin to the litany of response. In response to the word reflected on and with all that is going on in our lives, let us share together this special litany. Come to us, creating God, as the one who walks the way of ordinary people. Come to us as the one who weeps over the city. Come to us as the one who deeply understands the paradox of life which rises from death. Come to us in a language of grace, that we may approach you in vulnerable hope. Give us new life if the old has been destroyed in us. Give us openness if we have closed our hearts to your future. Give us courage if we tread this land in fear of bringing our gifts. Give us wisdom when we forget to listen to the learnings of our history. Give us joy when we see the breadth of your imagination expressed in the differences between us. Differences of race and culture, differences of history and journey, differences in our experience of you. Bind us together as those who feel your love under our feet in the warmth of this, our holy ground. Dance within our life, O Spirit of God, that we may be transformed by your eternal passion. Amen. Let us now worship God with our tithes and our offerings.
with me as we bless this week's tithes and offerings. We give our offering hopefully, hoping that you can use these gifts, hoping that these gifts can further your kingdom, hoping that your kingdom will come, your kingdom, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Have a beautiful week. Thank you for worshiping with us this week. Don't forget, after the postlude, I hope you'll join us for the Zoom coffee hour. The, the number again is 912-233-4351, and the password is Asbury with a capital A. Now will you join me in the responsive benediction? Now take the word of God into the world. We will place hope in the arms of others. Now take the word of Jesus into the world. We will follow to serve beside him in all the broken places. Now take the word of the Spirit into the world. We will bring others near to the kingdom where all are welcome. Peace be with you. Amen. Thank you.